Hey, Forty Zoo here. If you're ever amongst the 30 million tourists that visit the great city of London every year, you won't be surprised to find that England's capital offers something for everyone. There's overpriced pizza in Leicester Square for the foodies, cruises down the River Thames for lovers of water sports, and Buckingham Palace for people who enjoy sticking their faces through railings. You can even take a guided tour around some of the palace's staterooms, but if you want to get really up close and personal with the monarchy, you're better off heading downriver to the Tower of London. There, you'll be able to admire the king's ancient crown jewels and gaze with wonder upon his magnificent scepter. Unfortunately, you won't get the chance to grip his golden shaft with your own hands because the crown jewels are under armed guard by men dressed as pipe cleaners. But that hasn't stopped people from trying. In 1671, an Irishman by the name of Thomas Blood carried out a ballsy plan to steal a sovereign's swag. Over the course of a few months, he nurtured a relationship with the 77-year-old master of the jewel house, pretending to be a nobleman and gradually earning his trust. Eventually, the keeper agreed to show Blood and his friends the precious jewels. But when they got inside, Blood whipped out a hammer and bonked the keeper nice and hard on the head then stabbed him a bit just to be on the safe side. But it was obviously just a flesh wound because the iron noggined keeper managed to sound the alarm before blood could escape with the loot. After he was captured, the Irish rogue was interrogated by the king himself, who, after hearing the whole story, did the natural kingly thing hmm. and gave blood a full pardon plus a large stretch of land in Ireland. To this day, nobody's quite sure why the king was so lenient. But obviously the moral of the story is, if you're brave enough to steal really, really expensive stuff, you'll be handsomely rewarded. Now go tell your parents. Are you tired of spending precious time preparing meals when you have a busy schedule, especially before or after a workout? I know I am. Well, Huel Complete Protein is the world's first nutritionally complete plant-based protein powder. It's made from sustainably sourced, high-quality, animal-free ingredients. Hemp, faba, and pea protein. It's naturally gluten-free and contains more essential amino acids per gram than whey protein. To make a Huel shake, I simply add 300 ml of water to my Huel shaker bottle, add a scoop of Huel Complete Protein, and, well, give it a good shake. My favorite is this chocolate fudge brownies flavor. I can't believe this stuff is actually good for me because it's so rich and chocolatey. Honestly, it tastes really good. I've been trying a bit better to keep in shape recently and it's so important after a workout to fuel upon protein. Your muscles need protein to repair themselves and each serving of fuel contains a massive 20 grams of plant-based protein, nine grams of essential amino acids, five grams of branched chain amino acids, and all with less than 105 calories per serving. Did I mention it's also really affordable? So click the link in the description below to try Huel today. If you use my special link, you'll be supporting the channel and with your first order, you'll also receive a free shaker, a Huel t-shirt, and a guide to help you get started. A big thanks to Huel for sponsoring this video. The Tower of London has been home to the Royal Gems since the 13th century. But over the course of its long history, it's acted as much more than the world's biggest jewellery box. In 1066, a massive French bastard called William the Bastard changed his name to William the Conqueror by conquering England. After which, he ordered the construction of the Tower of London as a way to solidify his new rule with a giant oppressive structure. The central keep, the White Tower, was completed by 1100. Over the following 500 years, the tower acted as a royal residence to many monarchs, including Henry III and Edward I. But it gained the most infamy as a prison. Some of history's biggest names were sent to the tower to await their fate, including the future Queen Elizabeth I, Guy Fawkes, Sir Walter Raleigh, and two of Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Lady Jane Grey. Unfortunately, for the last two, their stay ended in involuntary neck removal surgery. And in 1941, German spy Josef Jakobs became the last person to be executed on tower grounds. The tower's last ever prisoners, oddly enough, were infamous London gangsters, the Cray Twins, who were sent there in 1952 for failing to report for national service. 
Across the centuries, the tower played a crucial role in defending London. Its location on the Thames allowed it to control access to the city, and it served as a stronghold during conflicts like the Wars of the Roses and the English Civil War. But its history doesn't just revolve around what its walls kept out, but also what they kept in. Because from the 13th century to the early 1800s, the Tower of London also functioned as a royal zoo. Now, you know that awkward moment when someone gifts you an apex predator and you're just not sure where to put it? Well, in 1235, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II said something along the lines of, hold my mead, and then presented Henry III with three lions, who naturally decided the best place to shove them was in the Tower of London with all the prisoners. If the thought of three lions makes you want to drink lager and kick things, you're probably an English football fan. England's football teams have worn three lions on their shirts ever since their very first international match against Scotland back in 1872. But the symbol itself can be traced back 800 years to the Royal Coat of Arms of England, adopted by the Plantagenet Kings sometime around 1200 AD. So, by gifting three lions to the English crown, Frederick II was engaging in a spot of international arse licking designed to <laughs> curry favour with King Henry. In 1252, Hakon IV, King of Norway, made his own bid for the title of most inappropriate gift in history when he gave Henry a polar bear, which caused a stir amongst Londoners as it was allowed out of the tower to swim in the River Thames to hunt for fish. A few years later, King Louis IX of France presented Henry with an elephant, the first to live in England since the Romans invaded in 43 AD. King Louis had actually received the pachyderm from the Egyptians, so it was a bit like handing off the socks you got for Christmas as a birthday present to your brother-in-law. But Henry was absolutely delighted by this hand-me-down elephant, and he ordered the construction of an absolutely massive bespoke elephant enclosure. Yet, sadly, after only three years, it was dead. In fact, many of the tower's animals suffered a premature death, these weird and wonderful creatures from across the globe were fascinating to look at, but nobody in England had the faintest idea of how to actually care for them. As a result, the animals endured a higher mortality rate than a red shirt in Star Trek. Henry III may seem like a bit of an eccentric, but it turns out he was only carrying on a proud family tradition. His ancestor and son of William the Conqueror, Henry I, had kept a collection of exotic animals on his Woodstock estate in Oxfordshire from the early 1100s. Via his contacts in foreign royalty, he'd collected an assortment of animals, including camels, lions, and porcupines. But his interests were far from zoological. As a keen hunter, he kept these beasts alive, purely so he could murder them later and then brag about it to his mates. But thankfully in 1272, Henry stopped murdering the poor creatures because he too was murdered by his own body because it died of old age. And so the Woodstock Menagerie was sent to the Tower of London, where the animals joined a growing congregation. Around 1290, Edward I added another lion and a lynx to the mix. He even built a dedicated structure for the lions, which would later become known cryptically as the Lion Tower. And he appointed the first official Master of the King's Bears and Apes. Which, to be fair, sounds like a much more believable job title than a lot of the crap we have today, such as Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer. His descendant, Edward III, added a couple of more lions. They were absolutely mental for lions back then, weren't they? They also loved the odd leopard, and later kings brought in jackals, hyenas, and more. In the 15th century, all the lions died, and the keeper was, understandably, sacked. But when the 1600s rolled around, under the reign of James I, British explorers started pushing deeper into Africa, and began bringing back lions like they were bottles of duty-free vodka, mostly to supply the horrific lion-baiting sport, which was all the rage back then. In case you aren't familiar, lion baiting involves pitting lions against dogs in fights to the death. Now, obviously, a lion would easily tear two shades of shit out of a dog. So, to even the odds, the dogs were given nothing. 
absolutely nothing. They all just died horribly. When he wasn't sending dogs to their deaths, James was busy fleshing out the Tower Menagerie with such exotic marvels as camels, a tiger, a flying squirrel, and an Indian elephant. Apparently, English elephant care hadn't advanced all that much, because instead of water, the poor creature was given a barrel of wine every day between September and April. Apparently, the keepers thought a booze jacket would keep it warm over the winter. It didn't. By the early part of the following century, there were a total of 11 lions, along with various other cats, jackals, and birds of prey living in the tower. Sir Christopher Wren, that's the famed architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, not a knighted bird, was even commissioned to oversee the construction of a new lion house. Up until this point, the collection of wild and probably quite unhappy exotic animals was mostly kept for the diversion and merriment of the monarchy. You know, when they got bored of pushing gold coins into prisoners' eye sockets or whatever. But by the 18th century, the Royal Menagerie was opened to the public and started to look like what we might today call a zoo. Entry cost three half pence, but if you couldn't afford the fee, no worries. All you had to do was bring along a cat or dog that could be fed to the lions. Seriously, that was actually a thing. In 1811, King George III was gifted a massive grizzly bear named Martin, the first ever seen in England. And soon afterwards, two ostriches were added to the collection. In yet another stroke of zoological genius, the big birds were fed on a diet of nails, because some 19th century twats decided they were able to digest iron. In an incredibly surprising turn of events, one of the ostriches died. It's awful meals proving to be the final nail in a very long coffin. By 1821, after centuries of sort of well-meaning but ultimately shit animal care, all that was left of the Royal Menagerie was good old Martin and a handful of big cats. But the shockingly short life expectancy of the animals was about to change with the appointment of a new keeper, Alfred Copps. Instead of waiting for rich aristocrats and foreign dignitaries to present the king with animals as gifts, something that was increasingly rare anyway, Copps actively sought new creatures to add to the menagerie. He bought never-before-seen animals like zebras, alligators, and kangaroos to the tower. And by the time he was done, Copps had built up a collection that included some 280 animals from more than 60 species. It was hard work, and along the way, he was almost strangled by a hungry boa constrictor during a public demonstration. But that was far from the first animal-related incident recorded at the tower. In 1686, a woman by the name of Mary Jenkinson died after being mauled by a lion. And in the 1700s, a young sailor was killed when a baboon threw a cannonball at his head. But in 1830, things really kicked off. A man was attacked by a leopard, a monkey bit another man's leg, and a wolf escaped, never to be seen again. It was fast becoming clear that the Royal Menagerie was becoming a royal pain in the arse. And around this time, a decision was made to move all of the animals to Regent's Park where the Zoological Society of London had established what is today known as London Zoo. By 1835, the only furry things left at the Tower of London were the guards' headgear. It was the end of a 600-year era, but it must have been quite a relief for the animals, who by then were probably rather tired of maltreatment, malnutrition, and death. In the almost 200 years since, animal welfare has continued to improve, and whilst zoos are still controversial in the eyes of many, at least we no longer serve the elephants buckets of Merlot. Thanks for watching.